Today's podcast is brought to you by Inverted Gear. For all your jujitsu needs, go to invertedgear.com. Save 15% off if you type in the coupon code SHOWTHEART15 with no spaces. Our next sponsor is Chimera Coffee. That's Chimera Coffee with a K. They are a coffee brand that infused their coffee with nootropics. If you don't know what nootropics are, Google it. They can do a much better job at explaining it than I can. Go to ChimeraCoffee.com, type in the coupon code SHOWTHEART for a nice little discount. Enjoy. David, hey, cool. it's me and uh, my partner, Marcos. What's up, man? Hey, what's up, Marcos? How you doing? What's up, bad man? How are you? Good, man. <laughs> you just woke up. Did you eat some of that turkey bacon yet? That, some of that green tea? <laughs> How did you know, man? <laughs> I had the turkey bacon before went to bed, actually, like 3 or 4 a.m. Damn, my type of dude. My brother got married this weekend, so I had to go on a big road trip with my girlfriend across Canada and attend the wedding and come back yesterday. And then, yeah, it's just, it's been a lot. Nice. And then, like, I had to go there a week before for a tournament, and then next week I have to travel to New York for a couple of weeks. It, it, whatever. What part of Canada you, are you, you from? Ran? What? What part of Canada are you from? I'm from like, like the French part of Canada, the really, really, really French part of okay. the George St. Pierre area, I guess, <laughs> if you mark it with a fighter. Nice, man. Um, Do you speak French? Yeah, that's like, um, I completely understand it. I, I, I grew up with a really bad learning difficulty where I couldn't actually pick up like how to speak it, okay. but I was able to, like, it caused a lot of problems as a kid because... I couldn't communicate with other kids my age, obviously. Huh. Um, but it's okay. I mean, I'm just, in, in a weird way, I was able to pick up English, which, you know, is like a more international language, you know, so. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, it, I was just thinking about that the other day with with my girl. Like, everybody knows English everywhere. How did that happen where all most countries in the world, like, the commonality is, like, English? Yeah, it's very common. You know, if you go to Europe, for example... You, you can get away talking English and people will understand, you know, um, I think in Quebec, a very interesting thing is the French people don't want to understand the English anymore though. Really? It's like, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, that's the whole thing about Quebec is Quebec is still French because they refuse to be assimilated into the English language. Uh-huh. You know, we have lots of language and laws in place where if you advertise it, the advertising French bigger than English. Stuff like this, oh. like keep the French really, really strong here. Yeah. Like, like if a, a French couple have a child and they want to send their child to English school, one of them had to attend the English school prior to have that right. If both parents are French and attended French school, they would not be allowed to send their child to an English school. Uh-huh. Like that, that yeah. really changes a lot, man. Trust me. Sure. Like I mean, two French parents so usually want to send their kids in English school in today's generation. Yeah. But they don't have that right. So now they have to move out of Quebec. They have to go to Ontario or the States. You know, so it's very interesting. Nice, but, man. Yeah. How did you get into Jiu Jitsu? What is your background in Jiu Jitsu? In Jiu Jitsu itself? Yeah. So. When I was uh, 12 years old, uh, my brother did the whole VHS thing. He actually went to the, the store and he rented a bunch of VHSs. Uh-huh. I think like half of them were those really thick VHSs of yeah. where you see people dying or people eating monkey brains, you oh know, stuff God. like that from yeah. the old days, right? Okay. Whatever sick stuff they could put on VHS and yeah. rent at a video store, he, he rented. But he also rented like a bunch of UFCs as well. Nice. But, you know, just typical story of people getting into it. Um, I got to see, um, I remember the first UFC I saw was the Guy Mezger Tito Ortiz event. Nice. The one where, the one where Guy beat Tito. Okay. So, you know, Tito beat him up all three rounds, third round, shot in to take him down. He catches him in the guillotine. The fight's over, uh-huh. you know. And Tito's upset. I'm like thinking, what the f- wait? What the fuck happened? Like he beat the shit out of him, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like he clearly won, and he got like his arms around his neck or something, tied his legs around him, and he tapped him. Like, <sighs> like he choked him out. Like what happened? And like the next day, I started just, like going online trying to figure out what the name of the move is called. Like this a guillotine choke. So, so I'm like you know guillotine choke and. I was like when I was 12 or 13, super into hockey since I'm from Quebec, since I'm from Canada, right? So everyone's playing hockey. That's uh-huh. a true story. Everybody does play hockey when they're a kid, especially the boys. Okay. Um, if you don't get to play hockey, it's like, 
it's like you actually feel really embarrassed because everyone wants to play hockey here. <laughs> so I actually made the move from hockey to jiu-jitsu, which is really weird. Um, that's a like bad 12 or 13 move, years old. And, <laughs> that's a bad, and, bad and move. That's it. Like I started training at 13 at like, um, at the time in Montreal, it was called Gamma. It was like a, a Novinelle gym. Okay. Um, Wagney Fabiano, who you might have heard from yeah, um, of course. W- UFC. Leo Santos' his brother mm-hmm. from the UFC. And um, Wagney left to Toronto. And a couple of years later, we, we had this guy, Ahmad Zahabi, teaching us. Ahmad Zahabi is actually for us, Zahabi's older brother. He's okay. a doctor. Oh. Um, a black belt now under Wagney. And eventually, Fabio Holanda showed up in Montreal. He's from BTT. Um, and then he became the instructor and that's around like the first two years of my jiu-jitsu around like, you know, 12 to 15, I would say. Wow. And what kind of jiu-jitsu do you say, would you say that you learned? Like what kind of a base did you have? Did they teach you back then? Was it very MMA oriented or was it like Gracie jiu-jitsu oriented or was it sport jiu-jitsu? At the beginning, 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 like I would say like 15 years ago, or even past 15 years ago, it was a very basic jiu-jitsu where, like, you know, like, there was no deep half guard. There was no 50-50. There was no bolo yet. Um, everything was a little bit more basic. It was just, like, I remember um, late in my white belt, uh, my white beltness, <laughs> there was a Leo Santos seminar, you know, the guy who's actually in USD right now. <laughs> um the guy who's flying on bar to our same at ADCC. So, uh, Luther Santos came in and he gave like a three hour half guard seminar. Nice. And I just remember going up to the owner of the gym afterwards. I'm like, I don't think I'm going to come back tomorrow. I didn't understand anything today. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that was like, that was like 15, 16 years ago. Everyone's trying to figure out what the fuck the half guard is. I think that's when Gordo made the super big because Gordo had just created the half guard from Henzo's. So everyone was trying to learn what half guard was now. So um, it was really uncomfortable for a lot of people. No one knew how to do the waiter sweep yet. You know, no yeah. one really knew what half guard was yet. So it was so basic. Like people were learning quarter guard and stuff like this, a very basic level of the Hiva, but no one really had any pain techniques yet. Sure. And I bet it was very um, difficult to convince people that a half guard could be an offensive position because it was probably more of a, you kind of wind up there just from defending the pass. Yeah, the point of people pulling the half guard instead of pulling full guard or open guard wasn't there yet. We hadn't seen people just, you know, grab their opponent and pull half guard. Like, nowadays you're seeing that tons, you know? Yeah. Um, but you never saw that back then, man. You know, like half guard was seen as a position where you only had half, right? Yep. So you, you were losing, supposedly. Mm-hmm. You're halfway past. Yeah, you know, yeah. It, it's really amazing how all those theories changed with jujitsu over the years as well. Mm-hmm. I think it starts with trust and then exploration, or exploration and then trust. But yeah. you got to start trusting positions and and really going outside yeah. your box of comfort. And yeah. trying new things. I think so. I think back then too, you had to travel a little bit. Like just, um, you know, George St. Pierre was training at those gyms as well before going to TriStar, and then I went to TriStar too. But I mean, even George was going to like Hanzo's in New York, or he had to travel elsewhere to take a technique back then. Um, nowadays, I think like most gyms should be well versed. Like who's ever the main instructor at the big gym nowadays is usually really well like. Well versed, I think. Like, if if you're in New York, you got Dana Hart, and Marcel Garcia, for example. They're both like brilliant opposites, you know. Yeah. Um, in Montreal, you have Farhat Sahabi. Whichever city you go to, you'll have an example of someone mm-hmm. who knows what they're talking about. You know, sure. like the days of like one person in a whole region knowing what they're talking about, compared to today where you can find ten, fifteen black belts in your region. Like the times have changed. Yeah. You know? Do you believe that this is something that I that I've been thinking about a lot lately? Do you believe that the the culture of the area that you live in does that determine the style of jujitsu um, that the people that train there have? Like as a like a New York as opposed to a California or a Montreal, you know, like does the style, the way of living, the energy of the town, does that kind of determine or not determine, but influence the style of jiu-jitsu that people have if you live in a busy city those people might be more of an aggressive style 
if you live in a beach. I think it, yeah. I think it depends more on the instructor, right? Um, in Montreal, like the main opposition to uh, TriStar is, like I said, Brazil and Top Team Canada. Um, in Brazil and Top Team Canada, they're very well known for Kimuros. I trained there for six years. I got my, my blue and purple belts there. Um, in like 2002 and 2004. Mm-hmm. And I just remember it's always Kimura, Kimura, Kimura. So you have all these chain techniques of Kimura because that instructor loved the Kimura and he really taught it well to the students on how to use it. Um, you can see the Kimura used by other gyms too, like David Avalon or uh, Lloyd Irvin or, or there's so many examples of uh, gyms using the Kimura or the Kimura trap, so many different things. Yeah. Um, where if you look at someone like the Mendes brothers, you know, they're showing everyone anaconda chokes and barambolos. Marcelo Garcia is showing everyone guillotine chokes. Yeah. And John Banahar is showing everyone leg walks. So depending on who you train under, I think that really changes your style. Um, one of our friends, someone I'm sponsoring for the last couple of years, Olivier Taza, he recently started going to New York a ton, yeah. uh, training under Danahar. Danahar started making posts about him. This guy's been training for two and a half years. He had one particular style, went to Danahar's, and over the last, like, you know, six months to a year, he's created an unbelievable leg lock style, you know? I think it's not as much the community or the tournaments in that area or the gyms that make up that area, but the coaches and what the coaches are known for and how the competitors are taking that from them, I sure. think. I, I definitely agree with that. And like we said before, if you come in and you trust your instructor 100 percent and you don't argue, you don't argue in your head about what you like and what you don't like. You just trust the, the instructor that has proven themselves with either their performances or with their other students performances. You will succeed. It's no secret why, you know, Marcelo's top students do very well and Dana Harris top students do very well. Those guys trust them 100% and they do the most. Oh, yeah. But I think we've all been there where we've all gone to a gym and we've all trained under an instructor and our instructor at class spent, you know, 30, 45 minutes showing us techniques that were bullshit. You know, I, I think yeah. we've all been to that type of gym at one point or another in our lives, uh-huh. either in trade and traveling or visiting gyms. Um, I've been to those types of gyms a lot. Where, you know, you, you spend the first like thirty minutes of technique drilling <laughs> shit that's bullshit. Yeah. You know? Like, oh, here's an armbar of ver- a ver- like a, a version of an armbar. And it's like, well, that's bullshit. Yeah. That's never gonna fucking work. I know. I've done jujitsu for the last twenty years. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it doesn't fucking make sense. Sure. You know? like, I recently had a. Sh- I recently had an experience with that. Um, it was, it, you know, I went to another school and they had a, an instructor. He wasn't the main instructor, but he was teaching and. I just like I'm not a I'm not a spider guard expert, so I don't play it often. But like okay. I can tell what will work when an opponent's resisting, and I'm like, you know what? Yeah. That is not gonna work. And if if I would do it anyway, I wouldn't do it like that. And it just kind of didn't it didn't sit well with me. And I just more than anything, I felt bad for the students. I'm like, uh, they're getting a false sense of what's reality. Now, if the instructor prefaces the the class that day by saying hey guys listen this technique is kind of a fantasy technique you're probably not going to get it off and if you do maybe it won't be exactly like this but it's good to drill these um these movements it'll build coordination and you can take pieces from this and it'll work in in various situations that's cool but you got to preface people by saying hey this this move yeah you make a really good point there where like even if the complete technique he's showing might not work in itself he could mention, hey, look, this isn't a technique that you take this technique and you do a one for one, but there's like several premises to this technique that you can tear apart and use in other ways. Or you could take this technique and just modify it to your own body mechanics to actually make it work, you know? Um, I obviously the way I do an arm bar from a close guard and the way you do an arm bar from a close guard is going to be a little bit different. Or it's exactly you know, the, the same. Way, you know, the angle, the way we step on the hip, if we step on the hip, yeah. stuff like this, it all changes person to person. I think that's the thing interesting with uh, teaching jiu-jitsu as well is the person who's teaching is teaching their version. You know, it might not work for everybody. Yes. You know, that, that person is just trying to pass on knowledge. And I think that's one of the 
things I think I've gotten into conversation so much lately is like passing your knowledge to people who have no concept of jujitsu. Mm. Because this is the whole concept of opening a gym. You know, you hear so many people say, I want to open a gym one day in jujitsu. And then I look at them and I'm like, well, do you know how to market uh, subscriptions? Yeah. Even though you have no bit, you know how to do that. And do you know how to train people that have absolutely no understanding of what jujitsu is, you know? Sure. And do you know how to teach and coach? Because they're different things. Coaching is different than teaching. Very good. Yeah. You know, yeah, coaching, very you, you have very to stay true. on track with people. You have to know people's uh, tendencies, watch them. And you have to know them a little personally to say, hey, I know this guy's personal life. I know when he can make it in and when he can't make it in. And, you know, sometimes yeah. this is bothering him or this is not bothering him. That's coaching. But teaching, yeah. but you could be a terrible coach, but an, an, an excellent coach instructor a teacher you know how to you know beautifully um tell people instructions on how to do a move step by step or the opposite you could be a terrible a suck ass <laughs> teacher but you're good at yeah. following people's lives and saying hey man this will work for you stop doing that that's not good yeah. that's important I, I feel yeah some some are just so some teachers are so, so competitive too and they're so sponsored like I think like the Otadio Souza situation out in California where he was competing so much and giving seminars away from the gym that the gym didn't want him there anymore and then they fired him and then that gym lost his Chrissy Baja title yeah you know the situation I'm talking about yeah, yeah, yeah. well it's very interesting because he was never actually there you know <laughs> yeah. so some students liked it because they were following their instructor on this trip this journey sure but a lot of students didn't like it because they were attending the gym where there wasn't the instructor there which is another thing i think we haven't touched on is the gyms where the instructor that's supposed to teach is never teaching yeah because <laughs> you know? you're you know? advertising that, that that blows my mind man to yeah. be honest oh, like I've, I've been to some of the gyms over the last year where i've had to pay 30 40 even 50 fucking dollars for a day Damn. You know, like, there are gyms in the States where it's $50 yeah. for a day, man. Definitely. And, like, I trained, like, three classes that day and didn't meet the person whose name was on the gym, you know? Yeah. And that person wasn't going to be there for another two weeks. So it's <laughs> not like I was going to meet that person if I came back tomorrow. Yeah. You know? Um, mm. That's problematic, man. Yeah. You know, I can't just plan my trips around when a person will be there and when or not. I thought that was their place. That was their, like, sure. home or something. Yeah, I mean, and I, I get, like, people go on vacation, but you know when somebody is advertising a gym and they're with their name, but they're never there, it's just kind of a moneymaker. That's one of the reasons why we never really affiliated with any any one or any particular school. We kind of made our own thing because we just didn't believe in marketing somebody else for us. Why not just market yourself? Why well, not? Well, Affiliations, man. I mean, I get in a lot of trouble for about what I'm about to say. But yeah, affiliations are really stupid concepts, right? Like, if I'm marketing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu to people that have no, no understanding yeah. what even Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is, they don't you know? care what name why, is on the thing. Yeah, why would I use a name of somebody else? Like, this is bad marketing, man. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. I, how am I branding this other person that these other people have no understanding who they are? You know. Absolutely. Yeah. Like when you come into somebody's school, it says Marcelo Garcia on the banner. You go in and the instructor introduces himself as somebody else. You're like, I thought it said. Yeah. Hi, I'm Paul Schneider. You know, but it turns out Paul Schneider is a fucking amazing junior. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah but it's, you know, but, but Marcelo Schreiner, turns out is only these four other days, for yeah, example. Exactly. Paul Schreiner actually works at his school and Marcelo is there. So that's. That's a good example of a of an instructor owning a school with his name on the marquee, and he's there most of the time anyway. Yeah, he is. I mean, he lives in the same building, exactly. just the building yeah. next door, right? Yeah. So, right. um, so, I mean, I went there. I went there last time for like two weeks, and I mean, I met him a bunch of times. I, I have no problem with the way that gyms ran, and I think that the people who actually do teach the classes and Marcel is not there are very competent. You know, what I mean, yes. they're all competitive black belts. And the move they're showing is the move that they want to drill that night anyways. You know, mm -hmm. so Absolutely. it fits it fit as what is legible is working. Mm -hmm. Now, with New York on topic, you're coming to New York. Ooh. Grappling Industries. What? And you have a big headline. What? How did that come about, man? And I remember talking <laughs> to you. I remember talking to you a, 
a few months ago about setting up the podcast and you were like listen man i want to come on and i have a big announcement we're gonna we're gonna do it soon and then you know we just never got in touch and then you made the announcement and everyone was like what the biggest headline <laughs> in 2016 what is the matchup marcos what <laughs> Gordon Ryan versus <laughs> Keenan, Keenan Cornelius. Ay, ay, ay. Dude. How did it happen? <laughs> that Man, ma- that match what? is a no brainer, but how did you go about that? Man, I'll start I'll start off the story with a, with a question. You ever you, you ever watch those TED Talks? Yeah, yes. a couple of them. <laughs> yeah, so there's this Canadian guy from Vancouver in a, in one of those TED Talks called Nardwar. <laughs> um, cool name. Nardwater is an interviewer from Canada. He has a stupid outfit, stupid hat. He's like this really, like, really, like, um, personality that's out there. And he interviews such huge names, right? Like okay. Kurt Cobain, Jay Z. And he got up there and he's like, You know how I interviewed these people? Paid them a lot and of money? Like, no, no. I asked them. <laughs> oh. Oh. And the whole crowd is there. They're all like business students or like, you know, master students. And they're like, what's wrong with this guy? What's the secret? And the whole like, sorry? Uh, they were asking themselves, what's the secret? How did he get these big names? Yeah. And he's like, I just asked him if I could have a conversation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and, you know, that premise is very interesting because everyone like thinks Keenan is some like special person. At the end of the day, Keenan does fucking jujitsu, you know? Yeah. He's a normal like, guy. Keenan. He has, that page, he has two Facebook pages, and he has a couple of very, like, valid emails that anyone can email, obviously. Um, look, uh, Gordon Ryan won EBI. Um, I already knew Gordon Ryan because I've, I've done a seminar. Of, I, I attended the seminar of his in Montreal. I know he's a great guy. All my friends are friends with him. Everyone has great things to say about him actually in person. He is actually a super nice guy, you know, Online, he's kind of a troll and stuff. He's kind of a fun personality online, but yeah. in real life, super caring guy, super nice guy, actually. Yeah, definitely. Um, and he made that post after EBI saying, I want to fight Keenan. Um, I think Keenan is like the best in the world. It would mean a lot to fight him. He's someone I've always looked up to. And I thought, you know, well, I'm already friends with Gordon. I have a really good connection with the Danahar Death Squad. Um, and their manager, I thought I'd ask him if they would take that fight. And give me the right to go see if I could get Keenan on board. They said, yeah, we'd love to fight Keenan, obviously. Nice. Um, and then it was a matter of like finding Keenan, <laughs> yeah. which I guess the story is more about finding Keenan, like <laughs> that documentary, <laughs> Finding the Sugar Man. Yeah. I think um, we're going to name this podcast episode Finding Keenan. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> that's a funny name. And that's cool. And yeah. one thing I hear like about. Part three, of, uh, yeah. part three of Finding Nemo and Finding Dory. Yeah. Going to be <laughs> Finding <fun>. Keenan. <laughs> <laughs> and Keenan's like an octopus fish. No, he's a worm. He's a he's a worm. He's a, it's a he's cartoon a, about finding a yeah. worm. He's an <laughs> octopus with worm limbs that can shape shit. Yeah. <laughs> and wears a it's guitar. A really really weird dude. Yeah. But yeah, um the yeah, same thing as always though, man. I mean, I sent him a message on Facebook of yeah. all things and I, I said, Hey, I'd like to talk to you about this match. Um, I'd like you to fight Gordon Ryan and I'd like it to be no time limit. Uh-huh. And um, he got back to me like the next day, and he's like, "Hey, let me think about it for a couple of days." Okay. Now, from what I understand about Keenan is, when Keenan ever said that to people, he never messaged them back. <laughs> oh, interesting. <laughs> I have a lot of friends that have gotten that you know initial response kind of thing from Keenan, and then he, Keenan's gone dark on them. But so Keenan went dark on me for like three, four days at that point. He never got back to me. Uh-huh. Um, and then he messaged me like a week later and he's like, Hey, you know what? I, I think I'd like that actually. Okay. Mm. Nice. Were you biting your nails and like rocking back and forth in a dark room? Like, when is he going to email me back? <laughs> no, I don't, I don't rock back and forth on these super fights until the paperwork is out. And uh, I'm waiting for both of them to sign paperwork. Cause uh, I've noticed that's always where people become like problematic. Okay. Yeah. Of course. People really suck at printing writing their name on something and sending it back. But they're good at saying, yeah, sure, let's do it. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Interesting. They're really great at saying, yeah, I'll do that. I'll take that much money. But they, they fucking hate writing their name on shit. And jujitsu people hate writing their names on letters of intent mm. or on on obligational contracts. So, and, you know, much of the contract I have with these super fighters for these super fights 
a lot of it protects them. Like, not much of it actually protects me, man. Okay. You know, like, it's showing them what they're getting paid. It's showing them what day they're getting paid, what form they're getting paid in. Um, you know, there's not much benefit to me except verifying that both fighters are signed so I can actually announce it without sure. looking like an idiot, you know? Like uh, the Bouchesha Roger Gracie thing that, oh, man. you know, Bouchesha wasn't even signed, you know? I mean, that that's what I was trying to avoid, you know? I, I didn't want Keenan to say, well, I never signed the contract. Fuck these guys, you know? Yeah, that that and that was a crazy so, situation. Yeah, yeah. I know it's none of our business, so, but uh, was it difficult to to get these guys to agree to terms? Well, that's the thing. So, uh, Keenan said, Hey, I'd like it actually. Can you tell me, like, what the conditions is? And I was like, Well, you know, I want to fly you in. Obviously, you're in San Diego. This flight's in New York. I'll fly you in. I'll put you in the hotel. Um, I was thinking of offering you this much money. Keenan replied one, te- like, a really short text message back. Hey, I'll do it for this much money. I thought, Hey, that much money isn't, like, that far off from what I wanted. Fuck it, I'll take it. Nice, you know? nice. And that was it. I mean, that was a, that was that was the thing. Um, yeah. So it wasn't counter to go. Yeah. You know, I think the story is a little bit more interesting if you get more behind the scenes in it, though. Um, you know, like then you have the super fight. You announce it. Everyone's going crazy. And behind the scenes, like I'm getting like these cup, like this, you know, these one, two, three sponsors to pay for the whole thing, right? Uh huh. So at the end of the day, I ended up with a, a free super fight, which is a super fight, in my opinion, of a year, except for maybe like that Paul Harris and, and Tonin fight. Yeah. Um, like it's a really great super fight. I have it for free. And, it, and that gave me the opportunity, I believe, at that point to just give it away for free as a stream. Nice, man. That's awesome. You know, every, every, a lot of people were asking me, why don't you stream it for two bucks or even run a donation site where people can donate eh. uh, to contribute to the super fight? You know what? Like, fuck it, man. Yeah. I have the super fight. Even if, if even if I didn't have the sponsors to cover the super fight, at that point, you know, I'm I'm, I'm that person that believes in giving this shit for free. I made this fight not just for myself but for the competitors yeah. to watch. I know people want to watch it. I know there's going to be over five thousand people watching live. Mm-hmm. Um, I have like kind of an estimate on what I think will be tuning in live on the Facebook page that day. Yeah, but I think for the most part, um, giving it away at free is just a good sign of that solidarity with for community. sure man and people are gonna look at that like this guy's a good dude whoever ran this organization is a good dude they gave us one of the biggest super matches for free not to say that the guys that give that don't give away super fights for free are doing it wrong no it's just a different kind of event and you felt like you can you can give this one away as <laughs> a nice gift and one I of the, the thing yeah. About, yeah i think the thing about super fights too is i learned in the last new york show is um <coughs> Events like events that are well done, like well constructed, um, making profit doesn't become that hard after a while. Uh-huh. Um, like um, this New York event is coming Saturday is my sixty fifth event. Wow, congrats! Like, sixty five times I've had to set up and tear down an event. You know, I know how much event, like how much money I mean, is left over after taxes. You yeah. know, yeah, um, and I. I know enough about that number to know that you can do some shit with it. You can give out a lot more cash prizes. We're already giving out cash prizes, so we can give out bigger cash prizes. Or, you know, we could do something that grabs international attention, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I thought to myself, you know, like, although this is an expensive fight, what if I don't make profit on the event? Well, I thought to myself, well, everyone's obviously going to know about the event anyway. Yeah. But it would be advertising, right? Just the number of advertising, the amount of advertising I've gotten off this fight has been a lot but at the same time um if if i could cover the event and still make profit it opens my mind to how much more i could do in the future 100 like, percent. i'm not I'm, I'm i don't want this to be the biggest fight i ever promote you know what i mean yeah i like, see what you're I'm, saying I'm, 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 i mean the moment i got that fight I, I gained so much confidence i mean i'm trying i'm trying really hard now to get jake shields for something i've got a bunch of great ideas for a fight for jake shield <laughs> Um, I don't think I like the fight that Jake Shields has been in lately, except for that AJ Agers I'm one. But um, I have some great ideas for him and some great great ideas for some other uh, competitors. I think like now that I know that I could get these fights sponsored or I, or I could cover these fights at least with what I'm going to make, it, it allows me a confidence to be able to put on better fights now. I think nice man, and that comes from it, experience. I'm not I'm not I'm not as scared as what it's going to cost, you know, and the the uh, the consequences of that budget. sure and like you said sometimes the exposure of of an event like giving away that fight for free the, the exposure you're going to get 
is going to be worth more sometimes than the actual money you can make if it was uh, being sold. Um, yeah, I think the exposure is acceptable for me because I'm in so many countries and so many cities now that the exposure is going to be seen by someone who could be competing in my tournament compared to as if I was only in New York. Exposure might not benefit me, you know? Um, exposure is only really, really good if you have something you can do with it. Um, I think the fact that we're expanding so hard right now um, is the exposure will only help us. Like during that live stream, we'll be telling everyone that we're expanding to Atlanta and Texas nice. in early 2017. Like we haven't told that to anyone yet. We just announced it right like two seconds ago, right here. <laughs> I mean, Atlanta, Atlanta and Texas, for example, would be the first two places we're expanding to next. Those would be the cities 11, 12 for us. We've also, we're also in the works for St. Louis and like filling in all the gaps, you know, and people that we're working with in these cities, like they're educated and trained promoters, you know. Okay. Um, I I think like people are gonna be really impressed about like the idea that we're going towards. Nice um, man. Like for example, like I think in California the biggest tournaments are the, the Dream Jiu Jitsu tournaments. Um, I'm not sure if you've ever heard of them. There's Sean Magliani yeah. and uh, Dan Hubler. Um, and Dan Hubler, who works for Dream and also works in the Labs, is gonna yeah. be my project manager in Texas. Um, and we believe that we're not only going to nail Texas, but it's going to lead us to California eventually. Um, awesome, I just man. don't want to do California until the last date. Mm. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, I what I like about your company, uh, obviously, I, I haven't been to any of your tournaments. They haven't been close enough. The New York one is close enough. And um, I don't think I'll be able to make it. I'm just getting married the day before. No big deal. But um, <laughs> but um, what I love about it from seeing online is your your marketing, your advertisement, your 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 graphics that you guys create are, are like really catchy, and I like them. Like like the oh, Keenan man, the and graphics. Yeah, man. Who who's your we graphic have a, we designer? Have a, <laughs> we have a we have a, a part written into our business plan on graphics. Uh-huh. <laughs> it yeah. actually like to post it because it's a legit story. Yeah. And it, it's a story we've had with our, our content designer saying like, we need it to be ugly. <laughs> 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 we've noticed that the uglier the stuff we put out, the more people love it. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're seeing like other tournaments like IBJJF not put up posters anymore. They're just putting out the um, their logo with the with the vet with the the city yeah. and the date. Yeah. And that's it. It's branded so well that people are like, Oh, I be JJF, New York, uh, July sixteen, yay, yeah. you know. But there's nothing else on the poster. Then you saw like people like fight grappling, right? Come out with beautiful posters. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, even Grappler's Quest, beautiful posters, yeah. Naga. And then you look at Naga, for example. And, like, one thing I've learned from Naga is, man, I think the ugly posters really, really work well. <laughs> <laughs> the mashups, yeah. And then, yeah, just mash that shit up. Yeah. Like, <laughs> use ideas that have nothing to do with jujitsu to sell it. Yeah. Like, we keep doing this one, once a year we do a show in Hamilton. And Hamilton's in Ontario, outside of Toronto. Hamilton is all steel mills, man. Uh-huh. So we just have, like, our posters have always been smoke, uh, smoke, uh, smoke chimneys. Um, from uh, factories, uh-huh. like it sounds ridiculous. There's no jujitsu, and it's just like smoke coming out of massive chimneys. But at the same time, this is what Hamilton is, you know. Yeah. Like last New York event, we used the uh, Statue of Liberty, you know, because that, that that is what New York is. Sure. <laughs> I mean, we we're, we don't need jujitsu to sell jujitsu tournaments. Mm-hmm. You know, people aren't very interested in that stuff anymore. Yeah, man. No, I, I mean, just we, we've seen playing and make it ugly. Yeah, it'll work well. <laughs> Like EBI, they've been they've been putting a lot of they've been compressing a lot of things into one little graphic for Instagram, and you've been seeing that like people like that shit. They like everything yeah. in one spot where they don't have to search all these different websites and stuff like that. Why not? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Our designer is actually from New Jersey. Um, his name is Dougie Spalzi. He's from uh, um, Submission. Let me put uh, Unlimited Arts. Okay. Um, that's like why he's he does so a good. really good job. Yeah. I mean, he's been working for us for like the last four years. Nice, man. So, um, I mean, he works obviously other jobs, but um, as far as taking care of our contracts and the designs, mm-hmm. everything, the medals and the, the posters and all the banners for like the last four years. Yeah. Um, well, Dougie, like, you're doing a good job, my man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a whole collection of that stuff now, yeah. obviously. Like, that's interesting when you get to 65 events. 
don't forget, you have these 64 event posts that you've gone through now. You know? Yeah. Um, How many more ideas? Then, yeah, exactly. How many more? He's like, uh, just last week, he's like, man, I'm having a hard time like creating this next Adelaide poster for Australia. And I'm like, hey, man, you better figure it out, bro. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. like, there's going to be like 35 fucking posters you're going to have to design this year, plus the medals and shit. Like, like you're going to have to get this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Like, like when, I can't have I you need to you need to be able to pump out a post yeah. in like three to four days now. I can't have you working on this shit for a week or two anymore. Uh-huh. Yeah, one mm-hmm. thing I used to do was collect UFC posters, like event posters. And I noticed I, I collected them for like two years. So I collected like two Oh, years. in real life? Yeah, like I would go to like That's awesome. I would I, go watch I have them a, and, yeah. I actually have a UFC poster collection myself. Nice. Like and I've always actually collected UFC posters. Yeah, I, I stopped doing it's the it. only collection I have. I stopped doing it. I used to do it because I would go and watch it at a at a restaurant and, and then ask them to take it when I went home. Now I just watch exactly. UFC at home, but I so I don't get opportunity. But what I noticed <laughs> from watching from, from collecting all these posters is <laughs> Over time, the design would be recycled, but changed a little. So, no. you know, it's just so many events that eventually, like, the same design will come back up, and they're like, you know what? Let's use that one again. But let's let's move this yeah. head. Let's, let's enlarge this guy's head and make this other guy's arm smaller and just change the background <laughs> color. And um, there's only so many ideas. One thing that you guys maybe uh, could try and do is go WWE on everybody and do like these big headlines. Oh man, we thought about it. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I we thought about having the Halloween Havoc and SummerSlam. Yeah, and, the, and redemption. All these sorts of things, right? Like we thought about that so much. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, to be honest, like I grew up as a kid as a huge WWE fan. Uh huh. Me too. There's a, there's a couple of things that people have to understand before they put down. WWE. First of all, it's the longest running weekly TV show in history. Wow. The only one watched more than Raw, uh, watched more than The Simpsons is Monday Night Raw. Holy crap. So let, let, let's put that into perspective. They've obviously got like one of the best event production and promotional companies in the world. There's mm-hmm. no doubt about it. The best yeah. promoter in the world, and even Dana White has said it, and other promoters have said it. I think even Bob Arum has said it, but the best promoter is Vince McMahon. Yeah. Vince McMahon is the best promoter. Even if you look at the history of WWE, how he was able to combine all the states together. Mm-hmm. I mean, that is an example of someone who wants to build some type of organization. It's, it, it's brilliant. Yeah. No, I mean, you're right. WWE is, I mean, it's just... <laughs> Even if you you're not... You take f- away so many lessons from it. Sure. Even if you're not a fan of, of watching it, you have to respect the power of it and... And like you said, the, the long standing of it and the type of fans it keeps, like it keeps a lot of fans for many years. Oh man, yeah. just like, you know, people are talking about, oh, you know, Eminem does great production at his concerts, Taylor Swift, Katy Perry, you know, productions at concerts are going up. And I'm always there in the background, men, Monday Night Raw, <laughs> 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 you know, weekly, you know, or yeah. like WrestleMania, dude, yeah. you know, or SummerSlam yeah. or Survivor Series, Royal Rumble. Yeah. The productions on these events rival UFC or even better, better. than UFC. Yeah. So the you question know, like, is, how are you going to make grappling industries look like Raw or look like, are you going to get the elevated stage and, and do firework <laughs> entrances? You see, that's that, that's a very interesting question, and I think that's 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 the point that you you start to find out that I actually differ from the more people. I don't want that stuff, man. Mm-hmm. You see, like I I think like the problem is, I'm at like this point where I'm all over Australia. I'm in Canada's major cities, and now I'm like really hitting up the American cities, really really strong in New York, Chicago, Atlanta, Texas. You know, yeah. um, St. Louis. We're starting to really pump it out here in the U.S. Um, I think the, the step is, like, first I need to do the cities and actually build the foundations. You know, I can't start bringing in ramps and bringing in the lighting, you know. Um, it works for Fight to Win. Yeah. Um, which, who, those guys are doing a great job. I just want to say that because I'm, I, I think they actually do a legitimate great yeah. job. Um, but when you add all that life up, that's around a, a single uh, Mac at a time event, you know. Like, it's like a super match super fight show, for example, mm-hmm. um, where I sit down in the audience and watch 20, 25 fights. Um, that, you could afford the lighting because you only have that one match to fight. 
But when you're when you're running the ten to twelve matches at once, the things you want to focus on are not the lighting and the production, the lighting and the fireworks and stuff. What I want to focus on is how do I maintain all twelve matches running consistently for nine hours. Yeah, I think once I'm able to do that, I mean. Those types of things benefit me more than if I was to bring in smoke and fire. Yeah, no, definitely. If 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 I tell you you're gonna fight at one o'clock, and you're there at one o'clock, and you say, "Hey, look at those fireworks and those sparklers; those are all really cool," but you don't actually fight till four o'clock, mm-hmm. I've wasted like three hours of your time. You know, sure. That will probably piss you off more than you enjoyed the the extra production. You know, one hundred percent. That's why people love the IBJJF events. Because when they say to be there at 1 o'clock, your division is going to start, your division will start at 1 o'clock. The only variable is that you might be the last guy on the bracket. But usually you're going around that time. That's why they've been able to establish them as one of the premier um you know, organization organizations well, in competitive. Jiu-jitsu. I don't think they are one of the premier. I think they are obviously the premier. Yeah, you know, as far as Brazilian <laughs> jiu-jitsu, like look, as far as Brazilian jiu-jitsu, um, NAGA, uh, United Arab Emirates uh, Jiu-Jitsu Federation, or ADCC, or EBI, or Polaris, or Fight to Win, or Grappling Industries, and whatever. Dude, none of these are currently that close to the IBJJF yet. Yeah. You know, I mean, like, none of those other brands are on my radar. I'm trying to get to, like, the IBJJF radar, you know? <laughs> yeah. One day I would like to rival the IBJJF because that means that I'm doing something similar yes. as far as number of shows and attendances. Sure. IBJJF is special, man. I mean, they have our shows selling out. They've got beautiful productions. Uh-huh. I mean, just the general consistency in the event is much better than what you would find at these other events that are popping up more and more yes, now. Yes, 100%. Um, you know, a lot of the brands that you're hearing about in the States, don't forget, they're only within the first 20 tournaments as well. Mm-hmm. You know, we don't even know if these people have, can survive the grind, you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, like, they like fight to win. Like, it, you, someone gave me a, an interesting perspective about them. It's like, they're, they just did their 10th event this weekend. Man, like, let's tune back in in a year, a year and a half, and see how they feel now, you know? Yeah. Once they've driven around for another year and a year and a half. I've been driving around for years, bro. Like, I have no <laughs> life anymore, man. Yeah. <laughs> like, I think, I think by myself a lot. <laughs> um, like, it gets lonely out there, man. Like, uh, you really start to have to compact it with other people or trying to find out how to delegate it away, you know? 100%, yeah. So, the grind is hard after a while. It becomes <laughs> harder, all those things. Yeah. Well, you've established yourself, my friend, and you guys have built a great tournament. And on that note, we got to run. We're running out of time. But um, just want to say, we really appreciate you coming on and, and talking about this, this super fight and your event in general. And, um, yeah. you know, we're big fans, man. Like I said, I'm, I'm a huge fan of graphics and I'm, I'm a huge fan of what you guys, how you guys promote your event. And that's really cool. <coughs> I really appreciate that, man. For sure, man. And if you want to make some announcements right now, real quick, tell people how they can reach your events, um, what the website is, things like oh. that. Oh, uh, great, man. Um, so the website is grapplingindustries.com. The Facebook page is Grappling Industries. If you go on YouTube and you write in Grappling Industries, you'll find us. Or if after YouTube you put the backslash and then you write in Montreal Grappling, you'll find us. It's an old school YouTube, right? YouTube is so old school. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Instagram, you'll find us at Grappling Industries too. Um, upcoming events, we've got four events coming up in September, beginning of October in Australia. We've got two Canadian events coming up in October, and we've got New York this upcoming uh, Saturday. I also want to announce that the next New York event will be October twenty second. Oh, wow. Um, there's going to be two super fights on that event instead of one. Um, I can tell you that the the second super fight of the day, like the uh, co-main, will be Mansur Kira versus Wagner Rasha. Really? Um, and nice. then there will be a main event fight to follow afterwards. That will awesome, be October man. 22nd yeah. in, uh, in Manhattan as well. Awesome, man. Thanks awesome. a lot for so, <laughs> breaking seeing some Seeing how Wagner dealt with People in the past beating Gary Tonin, putting up a really great fight against Gordon Ryan, beating Romulo Barrow in the past. I think uh, it makes a great match for Mancher. I think people forget that Mancher went full, like 40 minutes with Eddie yeah. Cummings. Eddie Cummings. Eddie Cummings ran a clinic on EBI, such a flawless uh, performance. But at the same time, don't forget, 
Manchur didn't get tapped by him in 40 minutes. Yeah. And uh, Manchur, uh, Manchur deserves to now continue to fight the big names. I mean, at will to beat AJ Agros, I have no one even talked about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know? Like, so I yeah, think I'm a big he, fan of Munch. Like, He's a cool guy. He's really good. Yeah, at I think Munch, <laughs> Munch is a cool guy. He's super yeah. big, strong New York, yeah. and bringing in like a former UFC fighter and a, a really big name in the Jiu Jitsu community, especially in Florida. Um, I think it really opens a lot of eyes to who put in this match. Awesome, man. Thanks a lot so, for, uh, for saying that. Boom. Bam. Yeah, that, that'll call me in October and we'll put something nice together for me. Sweet, man. Well, thanks a lot. We'll uh, we'll uh, talk to you soon, my brother. And registration closes for New York tomorrow night. That's the last thing I've got to say. <laughs> Drop the <laughs> mic. <laughs> Grappling thanks Industries, that, August on, 13th. Man. I appreciate it. No problem, man. August 13th, Grappling yeah. Industries. Get there. Yeah. Go on Instagram, follow, show the art, watch some amazing videos. Dang, you didn't have to say that. <laughs> yes, you did. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, man. Every, dude, everyone that does you just does it anyway, man. So. <laughs> it is what it is. We all do it. <laughs> we we love the twenty second awesome jujitsu videos. <laughs> hashtag nice. show the art. What is yeah, your hashtag? You guys, you guys, what? What is your hashtag? Hashtag just grappling industries. Yeah, sure. Boom. Do it, guys. Hey, man. Thanks a lot. <laughs> we'll talk to you soon. Peace, man. Hey, thanks, guys. I'll see you later. If you guys enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe, like, comment on our iTunes or Stitcher or any platform that you are on. It goes a really long way, guys. When you subscribe, it pushes us further along and it allows us to continue to bring you these podcast episodes with our guests. And it really helps out a lot to subscribe. It makes it a lot easier. It automatically downloads the episodes on iTunes. It's just easier to, to get us on your phone or your computer. So please subscribe. That's one of the biggest things you can help us out with.